Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual Grand Canyon Star Party. I'm Ranger Raider Lane, the National Park Service Coordinator for the event. And for 31 years running, Grand Canyon has been celebrating our pristine night skies through this annual event we call the Grand Canyon Star Party. Now, ordinarily, we invite hundreds of astronomers and thousands upon thousands of visitors to the park to enjoy eight nights of some of the darkest night skies in the United States. Now, each evening is kicked off with a special guest speaker in our theater, followed by telescope viewing, constellation tours, night sky photography workshops, and much, much more. Now, this year we are celebrating uh, Grand Canyon Star Party in the virtual realm, and we're really excited. We have a whole host of incredible speakers for you this year. Next year's Grand Canyon Star Party is going to be June 18th through the 25th, 2022. So mark your calendars and hopefully we'll be able to celebrate that on site uh, next year. Now, before we introduce uh, our special guest speakers this evening, I just have a couple, a few entities rather, I'd like to thank um, from the National Park Service for, help, uh, for helping to put on this special event. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Grand Canyon Conservancy. Now, they're the park's official nonprofit partner, and they do uh, tremendous work protecting and preserving the night skies in and around Grand Canyon National Park. I'd like to thank the International Dark Sky Association. They're the entity that certified Grand Canyon National Park as an international dark sky park back in June of 2019. I'd like to thank the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. They're the group that has been coming up to the park for decades to volunteer their time and expertise uh, to share the wonders of the universe with park visitors. And they're also conducting the virtual telescope viewing sessions um, after this program. So thank you so much for their continued support. And finally, for the Society for Cultural Astronomy in the American Southwest. Uh, they're an entity that helped organize uh, many of the special guest speakers this year. So thank you so much to them. And with that, I want to introduce tonight's special guest speakers. Uh, tonight, we are excited and honored to have David Begay and Nancy Maryboy. Now, David Begay, a PhD, is currently um, Associate Research Professor with the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, in the College of Pharmacy, Community and Environmental Health Program, uh, working with several federally funded health research projects. David is former adjunct faculty at Northern Arizona University Flagstaff in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. He's also a former professor and academic dean for Diné uh, or the Navajo Nation College. He is currently VP for the Indigenous Education Institute, uh, Friday uh, Haber, Washington. Um, and he has worked with the NSF and other federal projects, including NASA for 20 years. Uh, J, uh, JPL, Goddard Space Flight Center on heliophysics, educational outreach, I mean, just a ton of stuff. Uh, David is considered a tribal elder and provides cultural consultant services to many organizations and corporations, both in the United States interna and internationally. He is raised with a deep cultural knowledge, tradition, and language of the Diné people. He is a member of the Diné Hatali Spiritual and Herbal Healers Association. David is a disabled combat uh, Vietnam veteran and he's also currently a member of the Navajo Nation Human Research Review Board appointed by the Navajo Nation Council. Uh, now, Dr. Nancy C. Maryboy is the president and executive direct director of the Indigenous Education Institute located in the San Juan Islands in Washington and on the Navajo Nation. Uh, IEI is an all indigenous institution with a mission to preserve, protect, and apply traditional indigenous knowledge in contemporary settings. She is an affiliate professor at the University of Washington in the School of Environmental Sciences and Forestry. Uh, she has been the principal investigator, investigator for National Science Foundation funded projects, including the Cosmic Serpent, Native Universe, and CoPi for, uh, Co -PI for ad additional NSF projects. Dr. Mary Boy is a PI for NASA's Space Science Education Consortium and has worked with both Goddard Space Flight Center and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She works with the University of New Mexico Superfund program. She has written several books and numerous articles on, uh, on collaboration between indigenous communities uh, and science centers with a focus on Navajo astronomy. She works with the indigenous schools around the world and she was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award for the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries and Museums. Dr. Mary Boy is a Navajo and Cherokee. She comes from a family of traditional and med uh, med medical healers 
uh, on the Navajo Nation and in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Dr. Nancy Mary Boyd, David Begay, thank you so much for coming. It is a great honor to have you both with us tonight. I want to start off by uh, greeting everybody by my traditional uh, greeting words. Yate, I want to say yate to everybody. Uh, the word ya refers to the universe, the cosmos. And at a refers to the existence of the universe and the human participant. So whenever uh, uh, we greet people, we acknowledge the universe and uh, and also the human participants in the in this big universe. So that's how we say uh, greeting. Hello, welcome. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Radar, for your nice introduction. And thank you for the opportunity of being here, um, albeit virtual, but we're pretending we're at um, the Grand Canyon right now. And so in the background of where I'm sitting, um, you'll see Monument Valley. That's the, um, that's the backyard of my family's, um, where my family lives in um, southern Utah. Um, on the Navajo Nation. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a great privilege to be here tonight and to be sharing with all of you. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, we're not all there in person, maybe next year, but at least we can do something virtually right now. And so what we want to do tonight is talk to you a little bit about Navajo astronomy and how to see the skies through Navajo eyes. Um, this is something that's not in very many books. It's not in, um, you can't go to the library and learn all you want to know. Um, this is work that we did research on for 20, 25 years. Uh, we did our research, much of it together. David learning from the men's side of a family, and I learned from the female side of my family. And so when we put them together, we have more of a whole picture of what's going on in the skies. Um, so um, we'll go to the next slide here. So now you can see David and see me. Um, the the Diné Navajo word for star, Sitsuyo, refers to my ancient relation from where I come. When we look at the Milky Way galaxy at night, we are actually looking at ourselves. David? I think this goes back to um, how Navajos uh, relate to the universe. In the Navajo worldview, uh, uh, we are made out of uh, stars. And very similar to what the astrophysicists and astrobiology say about human uh, being made out of stardust. So I think uh, we have something in common here in Navajo. When they say Setsuyo, they're referring to their ancient past. And that they are a part of a much bigger universe. And, and in this world, we are experiencing our existence as a human. But we're also related to, the, to our ancient past, the star, the energy, um, that preceded our life. Uh, what we have here is a Navajo Hogan. It's a traditional home. Um, whenever uh, you see a Hogan on the Navajo uh, reservation, you will see uh, the Hogan facing east. And the Hogan is made in accordance with the natural cosmic cycle, the summer solstice, the winter solstice, and the equinoxes. And so whenever you go into Hogan, you go uh, clockwise uh, or sunrise, if you say it in Navajo, Shabike. 
in uh, this uh, direction of the sun. You walk in accordance with the, re- the direction of the sun and how the, uh, the sun uh, travels. Um, uh, most of the stories about Navajo uh, star stories, the, the constellation, are told in the winter time. But there's a, a small uh, part during midsummer. Navajos they refer to that period as Shinichni uh, meaning the summer. Ishni is referring to the midsummer. And that refers to the summer solstice. And so traditionally, people can talk about these winter stories uh, there at that time very briefly. So what we're presenting is consistent with that teaching. Yes, and the Hogan that you see here is um, somewhere west of Monument Valley. And this is a female Hogan. So it's rounded and this particular region of Navajo Nation, the Hogans are made of the sand, a sort of a sandy, muddy mixture um, over a wooden frame. There are also male Hogans. There are also Hogans made of logs. Um, And today they are sometimes made of all kinds of different materials. If If you look at the shape of the Hogan, it's a reflection of the sky. It's, it's a dome shape, and it's what you see if you're standing um, on the ground looking up. You'll see the sky as a kind of a dome-shaped sky. And so all of the stars that we're going to be talking about um, fall into this, what, where, what direction you're looking at, and then the top of the sky. And the North Star would be about halfway up to the top of the sky if you were looking north. This this particular shot was taken looking west. Um, So what we want to do right now is talk a little bit about worldviews because all all cultures have had in the past and many have them today, um, an astronomy. And most tribes have a very rich, um, complex version of the skies as they sometimes you'll hear people say as above, as below. Um, but but it all is dependent on a sense of place. Where, where are you rooted? Where does your family come from? What are the stories of the land um, that you're on? What are the stories of the sky that's above? And that interrelationship of earth and sky is so important. And that sense of of place is so important. So that sense of place determines to a great extent what is your worldview. Now, on this slide, we're showing you two different worldviews, just just to make this point. Um, All kinds of different cultures have their own worldviews, whether it's Peru or India or Celtic, or in this case, you're seeing the Navajo worldview and the Mayan worldview. The Mayans, um, this particular Um, One came from down in the Yucatan, and this was done years and years ago for National Geographic, but we've always liked this slide. And what's interesting in this slide is that they're um, featuring four different colors of of the earth. So you've got white and red and yellow and black. Um, And then you'll see the Navajo has four different colors also. But you'll also see different worlds. So if you start at the bottom, that's the underworld. That's where um, Mayan um, athletes would play ball games. But they were were not like our um, NBA basketball games. These games um, were life and death games. And if you were on the losing team and you were the captain, you would lose your head. So the games were played with very high stakes. That was the underworld. And then you come up to the yellow world, which is the, a world of plants. And then you go up to a third world, which is where you see um, a pyramid. And then that connects you to the sky and you'll see different constellations of the mines in the sky. And now we'll switch over to the Navajo worldview and David will explain that. Uh, if you peek through the mind of a Navajo traditional uh, person uh, and how that mind works, 
this uh, Navajo worldview that you see here might be a way uh, this traditional person might be uh, thinking. Um, they believe that they emerge from an original light, uh, pretty much uh, related to what we discussed earlier, Satsuyo, Satsuya, that, you know, what preceded all life process uh, is uh, starlight. And uh, so that's what you see here in this uh, uh, Navajo worldview that's uh, shown here. On the bottom, there's a, a black star and that, uh, that preceded all life process. And that's how Navajos emerged to this world. And to this world, they were uh, uh, given uh, uh, land uh, with uh, uh, boundaries. Uh, so if you look straight across, you see e, uh, East, you see E. And that refers to Mount Blanca, the south on the right side, be Mount Taylor on, on the west side is San Francisco Peak by Flagstaff and the north uh, Mount uh, Hesperus by uh, Durango. And so Navajos uh, refer to uh, their homeland uh, by these uh, sacred mountains. And, and you also see some Yeti figures uh, the white, the turquoise, the yellow, and the black. That refers to the different parts of the day, white uh, representing uh, pre-dawn, uh, midday, the turquoise, uh, evening, uh, evening twilight when the sun goes down, and then the black uh, uh, represents uh, the darkness or the night. So it's really the natural cosmic order, what you see here. And then there's uh, eight main constellations that uh, Navajos um, refer to most of the time. And then there's other time when they refer to uh, 12 main constellation. And so that's what we have the picket uh, up here on the upper part. And this is what uh, Nancy was talking about. This is a Hogan, you know, the Hogan was made with this in mind, you know, the dome on top and, and then the, the inside. If you go inside a whole gun, it'll be circle like that, what you see right here. Okay. Um, you might be wondering how ancient star knowledge is acquired. As I already said, you can't go to a library and look it up. You may be able to go to uh, Google and find something on, online. But when we started out our research about 25 years ago, um, the only way you could get this information was to go to knowledge holders, primarily elders and medicine people. And um, so at that point, a lot of tribes have this knowledge and they keep it um, they keep it protected they don't let it out of the tribe they because it's sacred knowledge and so we're always very careful what what we leave out and what we share with others but basically um, the knowledge is acquired um, from from people it's an oral it's an oral knowledge and um, so elders like this woman um, that that's a primary way to get your knowledge. I would get it from elder women in my family. David would get it from elder men in his family. We also went to traditional practitioners, medicine people, and um, you couldn't just go to them and ask a question like, "Well, uh, uh, where's where's um, the Big Dipper and what does it signify?" You have to you have to they question you first. What do you want that knowledge for? And it has to be for a really good reason. And for us, it was, we, we wanted to, our primary audience has always been young Navajos so that the knowledge will be carried on of the skies. Um, another way, um, it's very directly connected with learning from animals and birds and plants and what plants are coming up at certain times. And, and for example, um, 
in the month February, um, the eagles, the months are named after things that are happening. So in February, it has to do with the little eagles and their nests. But before the little eagles can be in a nest, there have to be um, food for them. And, bef- and that food is normally insects and worms. And then there has to be food for them. So it's all a cycle. And you, as you see, it all as as it unfolds um, from the insects, the worms, the um, uh, and and then the smaller birds, and then the eagles, and they all feed their own their own young. Um, this is directly connected with certain things that are happening in the sky, and what's being planted, and what's being harvested. So. So you have to see the whole picture interrelated. So you go to the animals and birds and plants. You do your round observations. You have to get up before dawn and go out because that's the time just before dawn when everything that is um, is visible that's really important Um, It happens just before the sun comes up. So a lot of our observations had to be done very early, and it always had to do with what was coming up in the eastern horizon just before the sun, and that's called um, in Western astronomy the heliacal rise. So you had to be looking at what stars were available and then imagining that hundreds of years ago, even thousands of years ago, people were using those stars to identify certain um, constellations and certain things they should be doing at that time of year. So it was very seasonally based. Um, We also had access to some ancient star maps that were done in the 1800s. Um, They were done um, in an older language. And so we had had a very complex process of translating them, which went with... um, I had to learn how to pronounce that old, old language and then say it to David. And then he had to take the ancient language back to today's Navajo. And then we had to put it into English and then an English that everyday speaking English. So there were many steps to every uh, all, all along the way. But this is how we got a lot of our information. Um, also, a lot of it is contained within ceremonial songs and language. And so having access to the language, we were able to go much, much further and deeper than people had gone before and resurrect certain things that had really been forgotten by mainstream Navajos, like, for example, the Thunderbird constellation. Um, And then we also used computer technology and we used programs like Starry Skies and we'd run the skies back and forth, back and forth. So we were because we wanted to identify the Navajo constellations with um, the Western Greek constellations, So we could point at a star and say, yes, Navajos did this with that star. And then um, um, but this is the name of the star in Western astronomy. So people could put the things together and we, we knew exactly what patterns and cycles we were talking about. Yeah. Um, one of our mission of uh, IEI, Indigenous Education Institute, is to uh, do outreach, educational outreach to... Um, to students uh, K through 12. Here, uh, we were working with Star School, um, which is located northeast of Flagstaff, Arizona. And one of the employee is here and uh, we were working with students and we handed out t-shirts. And so, Everybody got a T-shirt, and I think this is what he's – the employee here is trying to display on his T-shirt, the Navajo universe. And so what we did is uh, we uh, um, developed this uh, Navajo uh, star map uh, in comparison to the Greek uh, uh, star map. And we wanted to do a comparative uh, illustration and a comparative presentation. 
So people will use the Greek constellation as a reference. But uh, the only thing that comes out different is the, 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 the different pictures. Uh, uh, right in the center of this uh, T-shirt is the is 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 the North Star. Maybe we can go on to the next uh, um, slide where it shows the the Ne universe, the Ne uh, uh, map of the universe. And so, right at the center, there's a fire. And uh, there's a man and a woman. On the bottom is the man, on top is the woman. And the one on the bottom, we call it now, you know, male revolving one. The top one is a uh, female revolving one. It's, it's, and it's uh, Cassiopeia in Greek uh, constellation. And so they kind of go counterclockwise in, in the sky. And those three uh, are considered one group of stars, in male and female in the central fire. And so what we did is uh, we picked some of the main constellations like Pleiades, Orion, uh, Scorpius, and the, the, uh, people... Uh, uh, pretty much know these constellations. We wanted to work with them and mainly to educate the young uh, students so people will know uh, the cultural stories behind these constellations and make comparison to not only the Greek constellation but other constellations like the Babylon and, uh, and, and other, you know, uh, nationality like the Chinese and so mainly it's a uh, this work it was done to uh, uh, to reach out to young students so this this um, this is a poster we developed and they all all the numbers are compared to their names in Navajo and their names in English and their location. So some other ones you can see up here, there's a, down at the bottom, there's a coyote waving a, um, waving a blanket full of crystals. Um, that's a, that's a story about how the coyote brought chaos to the universe. There's a white horse um, with a rider who's carrying the moon. There's a bear. I'm, I'm going, um, clockwise here there's there's a bear which has to do with the thunderbird constellation there's um and keep going on around the sun is the uh, turquoise horse um with a um a, a being carrying carrying the sun and then we have a snake and we have um the pleiades um are just just a little bit to the right of, of the uh, North Star. Um, so basically, this is a way, what was fun when, was when all the students in, in the school put on their t-shirts and we went outside and it was like a wearable curriculum because they all could point out different stars on each other on the, because they, had, they were wearing the t-shirt that had all the locations. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about some of a little bit more about some of the Navajo constellations. This is the one we said um, that was the Navajo constellations, and in um, Western astronomy, these are normally considered three different constellations, but in Navajo, they're all considered one. And so in the middle, you see Navajo Bacon, the central fire. So this is like the central fire of the sky. This is also, you may know it as Polaris or the North Star. This is the star that doesn't move. And this is a star you can use for navigation. Um, it's pretty much what it's painted here is pretty much what you'll see if you go outside tonight um, toward the end of May and look up, you'll see uh, maybe like about 10, 11 at night, you'll see the Big Dipper with its um with the um, handle of the dipper pointing more up to the middle of the sky. And right across, you're going to see Cassiopeia. 
and then, of course, the central fire, if you remember back to the Hogan slide, even today in the Hogans and even today in Navajo homes, the fire, the central fire is where you you would do your cooking. It's how you'd stay warm. It's um, like what makes your house comfortable is usually if you have a fireplace or something that relates to a central fire. And then on the left here, you will see um, the male revolving one, Nahukas um, Bika. That is the uh, Big Dipper, as you can see by the stars on his um, clothes. And he's a warrior. And um, he's connected here with the crescent moon, the first crescent moon. And he's got eagle plume on his head. He's got bows and arrows because he's a warrior. He's got turquoise for protection. He's wearing a bow guard and holding an arrowhead. And then he has a medicine bag. So he's, he's all about being the father of the family and taking care of the family. Um, on the other side is Nankos Ba'ad, and she's the female. She's also a warrior, and she also has an eagle feather. And she here is represented by the full moon. And if you look down to where her hands are, she's also wearing a turquoise bracelet, and that's for protection. And she's got two weapons. Her weapons are the grinding stone and the stirring sticks. And with those, she can feed her family and keep them healthy. So she too never leaves the Hogan. She's always there and they're like the ideal uh, mother and father. And these stories were put up in the sky so that, um, because landforms can change. You can have floods, you can have a mountain uh, slip down, but the stars stay the same. And so um, the, they put stories up in the sky and connected with them. So those lessons, those virtues, those ways of living would always be there to remind the people. Another um, one that's very important in Navajo is the Pleiades. And this one, if you go outside, you're not going to see because this is the the time of year when the Pleiades become um, invisible from Earth. Um, it's really interesting. A lot of different tribes use the Pleiades to tell when to plant. And they also use them to tell what the harvest is going to be like. Um, but um, the um, Incas, for example, they, they use the Pleiades. Um, they use them to know when to plant. And so does Navajo. And so here you have the Pleiades and you have one shot on the right hand side that's a, a beautiful NASA a photograph from the Hubble uh, telescope. And on the left-hand side, you have one of our paintings. Um, we had this excellent painter named Melvin Bainbridge who did about 26 constellation paintings for us. Anyway, this one is of um, um, boys going out and they're learning um, how to be little warriors. And they're followed by a woman with a buckskin slung over her shoulder. And the boys get excited and they run, run on ahead and they go over a hill and they're not seen anymore. Okay, so um, that's an indication to Navajos that it's time to plant your corn. And that is connected with other things like certain waterfalls will start running down from the mountains and certain plants start growing. But this is with all these indicators, you plant your corn. And there's a little saying that says, don't let Dilyehe see you plant your seeds. Well, Dilyehe is the name, the Navajo name for the Pleiades. And the idea is um, when it becomes, it travels with the sun in April and May. And when the sun goes um, over the Western horizon for sunset, the Pleiades are also go over the Western horizon and then they become invisible from earth. Well, about, um, six weeks later, at the end of June or into July, you see them again. This time they're going to be in the east part of the sky. And when those are visible on the, um, um, for the lack of rise again, when they're visible on the horizon, then you stop planting. And if you don't follow these processes, you'll plant too early. And what will happen then is your, there could be an early frost and you'll lose your little plants. And if you plant too late, um, it's, you can also um, 
have a have um, an early fall frost and you lose your crop. So it's, it was very important. Um, you know, today we have calendars and we have computers and all this. We always know what time it is, and what season it is. But a long, long time ago, people had to depend on the stars for these kind of indicators. So um, the Pleiades are very, very important in a lot of cultures. And an interesting thing, if any of you drive Subarus, Subaru is the Japanese name for the Pleiades. So um, uh, that's, um, you know, that's lots of, lots of different cultures acknowledge the Pleiades. And they're, they're, the Navajo word Dilyeha means something like pin-like sparkles. They're kind of dim and they sparkle, but you can always see them because, because um, they're near Orion. And if you know where to look, you find Orion, you'll find the, um, you'll find the Pleiades just ahead of Orion. And so here's Orion. Orion is called Atze Atzozi in Navajo. And he too is a warrior. This is a really in, in, easy constellation to find in the sky, primarily because of these um, three stars that um, make what they call make up the belt of Orion. But Navajo, it's his quiver and arrows that you're seeing. And he is a warrior dressed totally traditionally with his bow and arrow, and he's a protector of the people. Um, on the other side, there, this is a, another Hubble photo of, of what's in Orion's belt. And this is a nebula, and this is where stars are born. So if you're looking up toward Orion and you see Orion's belt or you see Atsetsozi's um, arrow and quiver, and, um, and, and you will see that is where stars are made, created. Um, so it's, it's a really important part of the sky and, and very easy to see. And if you were looking for the Pleiades, you'd go past the hand of Orion and go out um, to the, uh, up to a little bit north, a little bit in front of him, and that's where the Pleiades will be. Here's another one that's important, really important for um, Navajo is the coyote. Ma'i is, is in, in uh, Navajo. And all kinds of tribes and peoples have a trickster element. It seems to be almost universal. And this one, the coyote, the Ma'i, is no exception. Now, if you were up in the Pacific Northwest, you would have stories about Raven coming in and disrupting the order. And if you were in Cherokee in North Carolina or in Oklahoma, you'd have stories about a giant rabbit coming in and disrupting the order. But because we're talking about Navajo, a sense of place now, it's the coyote that comes in and disrupts the order. And what he did is he brought chaos. And the way he did it is he, um, he uh, went up to where the holy beings were very carefully plant, placing stars in the sky. And he got very excited and he wanted to be part of it. And he, um, they said, all right, you can plant one star. And he planted one. And then he planted a second star. And then he said, well, it's kind of boring. I think I'll make it all happen differently. So when nobody was looking, he grabbed a pouch from one of the holy people. He threw it up in the air and hundreds of crystals scattered all over the sky. And they didn't have an order and they didn't have, obviously wouldn't have names. That is how the coyote created chaos. And there's always a little coyote factor everywhere. Just as you think everything is going right, something will come in and disrupt the order. You can almost bet on it. So um, anyway, that's the, that's the Navajo trickster. It's also a star. He has his own star too. It's called Canopus. And if you are in the more Southern part of the Navajo reservation or anywhere else further South, you will see Canopus. It's, a, it's, it's very much to the South, due South, and has a very tiny little orbit that just comes up and goes down, comes up and goes down, and only in like two months of the whole year. So um, he's also called, it's also called the monthless star because it, it, it doesn't even last for a month. So monthless star, that's the coyote. 
uh, the, the, the star, the coyote star, yeah. is referred to Maibizon. Uh, in, in Greek, it's uh, Canopus. And about the third week in um, uh, September of each year, this star will come up. And and it sits directly south from Navajo land. And every three years when this star comes up, Canopus, uh, a 13th moon is added to, uh, to realign and to put the universe back in order. Um, because the lunar calendar and the solar calendar are, are uh, two different processes. And so they use Canopus to bring uh, order back to the lunar cycle. So uh, right after Canopus comes up, right there afterward, uh, a 13th moon is uh, added. And what we have here is an, uh, a Navajo rock depicting uh, Father Sky, Mother Earth. Um, on the left side is the Father uh, Sky um, depictions as all the uh, main constellations, some of the constellations that we covered. They're all in here in this uh, figure, and uh, including the moon and the sun, and also the Milky Way. Um, all, and on the right side is uh, uh, Mother Earth, and it depicts uh, 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 some uh, major... Um, uh, food that Navajos use over the years, the corn, the squash, and the beans. Uh, many indigenous people in Central uh, America, South America, also use uh, corn, squash, and beans. It goes all the way up into North America and all the way to uh, the East Coast among the Iroquois and, uh, and, and also all the way into Canada. So this uh, food source goes uh, across the continent. And what we have here is the relationship between Mother Earth and Father Sky. The Earth is a participant of a much bigger universe. And the human being a part of the Earth is a participant of everything on Earth. And, and the human and the earth are participant of a much bigger universe. It's holistic. Everything is interconnected. It's one big universe, and we are a participant. And this is what it tries to show uh, here. Here we have uh, the sun. The sun is everything in Navajo. It makes everything happen. In the Navajo uh, worldview, for example, uh, when a Navajo uh, sees a whirlwind, an elder uh, sees a, a whirlwind, they will say that it's the sun acting. Or if they see uh, a tornado, they'll say, it's the sun acting. The tornado comes into being through the sun's heat and 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 the air that's up in, in the atmosphere. And so when when thunder when thunder emerges from the tornado, it's the sun acting. Whenever uh, there's something that falls, you know, to the ground. Uh, you know, it's the sun acting. You know, it's it's interrelated. The gravity is interrelated with the sun. Um, 
whenever uh, uh, people talk about electromagnetism and uh, Western Navajos talk about those things and they refer to it as uh, um, uh, through the, the elect, elect, electrical current exists uh, uh, in the sun uh, it makes its own nuclear fissions and you know that's how physics would talk about it and Navajos talk about that too and so uh, these things uh, can be talked about but uh, they take much longer uh, presentation. Um, Radar told you earlier that David and I work with NASA and have for about 20 years. And right now we're working with Goddard Space Flight Center in a, um, in a heat, it's called the heat consortium, um, which has to do with heliophysics. And so we were wondering, we've been wondering for a long time how we can connect um, Navajo astronomy with the sun. And David just shared with you some of these ways through electromagnetic forces and um, gravity, things like that. So there is a Navajo story about, um, uh, they call them the hero twins, um, Monster Slayer and Born for Water. And they... They um, were born when the sun impregnated two twin girls, and one of the twin girls had these, um, the monster slayer and born for water, and the other one had them a monster. And so as the twins grew up, they, they wanted to know who their father was. And when they found out their father was the son, they, they wanted to go see the son. And they had a very specific reason for going to the sun. Um, the monster and other monsters as well were roaming the earth. And one in particular was eating a lot of children. And this was a terrible thing, as you can imagine. And so they wanted to go to the sun and get some weapons they could bring back to help slay the monsters. And so they, they uh, began a long intricate journey, and, and there's not time to tell you the whole thing, but basically they visited Spider Woman, they got weapons like a bow and an arrow, and a, I mean, not a bow and an arrow, I'm sorry, an eagle plume. And they used that to protect themselves as they journeyed on a rainbow to the sun. And when these twins got to the sun, they went inside the sun where the house of the sun was. And at first the sun didn't recognize them and said, you can't, you're not my children, but he gave them all these tests and they passed every one. And finally the son had to admit that was that they were his boys. So he ended up giving them weapons and they got a bow and an arrow and they came back to earth um, and they were able to slay the monster. And this also could, you could look at as a, as a story for our times, because you can think of the COVID virus as a monster being um, in our time. And you can think of using the sun's rays to um, combat the COVID virus, um, because we know that sun and radiation can have an impact. So um, we were trying to figure out how we would relate this. And when we, we, we started remembering, yes, there were two sons, and uh, two boys, and they went to the sun. And then we started thinking about some of NASA's missions. And there's um, two right now, which are, are, are doing some amazing things. One is the Parker probe, which is going into the sun itself. And it has, um, it, it has all its heat shields at the, at the forefront of the, of, of the, um, of the, the machine. And it goes into the sun, but it but it keeps the, the part that's recording things stays cool enough to send it back to Earth the information. The other one is the solar orbiter, which goes has the wings sticking out, and it goes around the sun collecting all kinds of information about solar flares. So it's kind of like Navo has had two twins that went to the sun, and now NASA has two missions that are going to the sun. And Surprisingly enough, the um, scientists that are in charge of these missions are very interested in the Navajo story and what it stands for. So we're, we're working with them, and I think we'll have a, probably in a year or so, we'll have a PowerPoint or a video or something to explain um, the whole relationship. 
Anyway, that is the end of our presentation today. So we say thank you. And we say, ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we hope you've learned something you can use when you look at the skies wherever you are and hope to see you someday in the Grand Canyon. Goodbye. Well, thank you both so much. That was such a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, so many questions, but I'll just keep it down to maybe uh, one or two here. Uh, uh, it seems like from a lot of the talks we've heard this week, um, particularly from some of the uh, Puebloan peoples of the uh, uh, Grand Canyon region, that uh, that sun watching is a very important uh, part of some of those particular cultures. It seems like the Diné culture has um, a much more robust uh, constellation canon and maybe more of an attention towards the stars themselves. Um, is there some reason that you, that you can, or uh, do you wanna comment on how that might be accounted for or um, uh, is it is it just maybe in virtue of the very influential book you've both published, Sharing the Skies, that maybe has revealed much more um, star knowledge and things like that from the Diné culture? Or, or do you feel like the Diné um, culture actually does pay a little bit more attention to the stars for some particular reason? Let me take a crack at that, and then, then I'll hand it over to David. Um, good question, Raider. Really good question. Um, we've always thought, I mean, it, it's up to each tribe to let out which, what they think is um, appropriate. And, and we know that the Pueblos, I'm, I'm not talking about the, the Hopi or the ones in Arizona, but the Pueblos per se, don't you'll find they don't talk much about their own astronomy. They're, they're not supposed to, and they, they really keep it to themselves. But um, it makes sense to think that when you look at the, these um, ancestral Puebla places like um, Mesa Verde or Chaco Canyon that are so based on um, watching the sun and the, the solstices and the um, equinoxes when the sun's rays hit certain places on certain buildings, they were a more sedentary people and they were growing corn and they had to stay home and take care of their, um, they, they were planting corn way before Navajos were. And the Navajos, we know because we traced Navajo language similarities all the way up to Alaska. In the early 1990s, we'd go up and work with different Alaska knowledge holders. And um, we found that everything we told you about the Nahokos names, they have that name up there, Nahokos for the North Star. And so um, we, we followed the trail all the way down to, um, I think it was Sar Sea in British Columbia. And then um, they have Plains Indian influence. And so that's when some of the other stars got their names. Um, and, and so it was like Navos had a journey down from Alaska. I mean, they had to have because the language similarities show it all the way down. And since we had the language, we could talk to people and ask for their star knowledge and names. And so... Um, it was, it was really fascinating. But um, so Navajos were a nomadic people for a long, long time. And so where the sun was um, hitting a certain specific rock wouldn't have been as important as to follow, know where the North Star was and follow, you know, follow, um, follow the stars. And we've worked very closely with Native Hawaiians over the years. And um, in fact, I'd love to acknowledge one Kalepa Babayan, who just passed away, who was a really dear friend of ours and had was one of the main um, navigators for the Hokulea Round the World Voyage. And um, he and his um, um, accomplices, they, they traveled by canoe and they traveled by the stars 
and the waves and the birds. And they did, they traveled all the way around the world without any Western instruments. It's astonishing. And people like Kalepa, who was the captain, had all that in his mind and where the stars were at certain places. And, you know, if you're going from one place to another in the Pacific, you've got to depend on the stars because there's, there's nothing else. You know, there, there are other aspects like certain fish would come up and see them over and over in certain places. And when the birds were doing certain things, they knew they were inside of land, but they had to be really precise on triangulating their stars and, um, and their stars as they go over the equator and down into the Southern skies, everything changed. And so they had to have another stars to look, look for. And you had to, because if you were off, like, you know, um, 20 miles, you'd miss the island you were going to. <laughs> so right. uh, there's, there's, there's life and death. So there were, so different people had different, if whether they depended on the sun rays or the, you know, or the stars or the waves or whatever, it depended on their sense of place. Right. So that's, that's how I would answer your question. And David, if oh. you want to add something else, please do. Yeah, I think um, you have to uh, think of uh, the sun and the constellation as one big universe. Hmm. That seems to be real clear uh, when you talk to traditional people. Um, uh, <clears throat> the sun... Uh, uh, manifests itself uh, through different uh, process and motions. The emphasis seems to be more on the process and the motion of the sun. And so, for example, uh, um, for east and west, uh, we say for east, ha -a, where the sun comes up and it's never in one place because the sun travels uh, left and right and you know, the solstice and the equinox. So it's like constantly in motion and process. So where the sun comes up uh, every day, it's different yeah, in all the season and all the months. And so between these two, east and the west, where the sun comes up in the east, where the sun goes down in the west, um, and in between there, uh, how the sun travels between those two. Uh, so if you put those two together, you know, sort of like side by side, east and the west, directly between those two, will be directly uh, south. And that's where the sun travels, so it gives direction. And uh, and then for the north, you, you use north stars to do the four direction. Um, and uh, the sun and the constellation, they exist together. You know, it, 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 it provides day and night. And uh, and the Navajos use certain part of the of, of the night sky. Uh, for example, in the pre-dawn hour, uh, when the sun's light first emerges in the east direction, uh, they call the time Hayoska. Five minutes later. They refer to that period as naninilka. The light spreads out. Hmm. Five minutes later again, tahitilka. The light emerges up. Wow. And uh, and then the five minutes later again, it's that dawning process is over. But hmm. in that period, at that time, when the rays are going up, it's like a feather. And in that, in that time, each month, there's going to be a constellation. Be a constellation that's connected to that, to that uh, month. 
And, and between crescent moon and full moon of each month, there's a constellation that's going to appear. And it's going to be sitting in the sun rays. So you know, people refer to that as haliacal rise. And so then there's also the suns, you know, uh, how it interrelates with the movement of the season. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's 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 like riding there, and, and it's like happening all at the same time. You know, there's, uh, uh, you know, it just so happened that we uh, talk more about the the star constellation in the book, and we could easily probably write a a whole book on the sun by itself. And wow. so uh, there's there's many relationships. There's some personal relationship whenever. Yeah. Uh, the sun comes up, it will, uh, the sun rays will hit your forehead, you know, right, uh, you know, your forehead. And then the sun rays, the sunlight will go down from here this way, down to your feet. In the evening, when the sun goes down, it goes back the other way, from your feet all the way up. And the sunlight will, you know, uh, move, uh, you know, once it goes over over the hill on the western horizon, this is where the sunlight will uh, uh, move uh, away from the body. So uh, just like the, the star dust that we mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the same uh, uh, stories uh, goes with the sun. That, that, wow. that we are, we are star dust. We are sun, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, we, 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 we literally sun everything, you know, that the sun provides the resources, you know, is the, like what provides, you know, life without right. the sun, there would be no life, you know? And so the sun is life. And so there, you know, it, 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 Navajo would say that, you know, it's all that energy, energy and mixed matter, you know, right. and, wow. you know, it's a, uh, what Einstein talks about, same thing. And that yeah. was, you know, to now, this is old knowledge, you know, no, no, no big thing because, you know, some. <laughs> so. That's incredible. Well, that's, I mean, so from what I'm hearing from both of you, it's, it's just the, maybe the semi-recent history of nomadicism in the Diné culture um, means that the stars are maybe a little bit more important in the culture because independent of your latitude, you can be traveling over vast distances and still tell time based on the heliacal rising of stars, which is what you were, David was explaining there. And the fact that, um, David, you just mentioned that there's various names for the, the time periods just before the sun rises and as the sun rises is a testament to the fact that the Diné people have been watching the heliacal rising of stars for so long. Uh, just, just to have those names is, is incredible for, for that. So that's what a, what a beautiful and wonderful, unique cultural trait um, that you were just able to share with us. And uh, thank you so much for, for, for sharing that. And I think that's a great, great way to end uh, this, this talk. Um, everybody, please thank uh, David and Nancy in the chat when you get a chance. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about uh, Diné astronomy and uh, the, the, the cosmological worldview of the Navajo people, please check out their work, uh, Sharing the Skies, an amazing uh, a book, incredible resource that many people use around the Southwest here. Um, please stay tuned for the virtual telescope viewing sessions occurring right after this program. And again, the 2022 Grand Canyon Star Party is June 18th through the 25th. We hope to see um, all of you online visitors on site here next year for the star party. Cross your fingers that we'll be able to celebrate on site. And hopefully in future star parties, you'll be able to meet Nancy and David here on site at the Grand Canyon as we're going to try to get them as hard as we can to come and uh, visit us here at the Grand Canyon star party in future years. Um, so once again, David and Nancy, thank you so much for your time and knowledge and wisdom. And we really hope to see you at Grand Canyon in, uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. We hope so too. <laughs>